Assalamualaikum dan selamat pagi. Selamat sejahtera. Okey, um, Siapa yang dah melawat wiki IMK 209 Physical Properties of Food? How many of you have visited this wiki? Okay. Anyway, it's your choice. Uh, I'm not going to force you, but when you come to this wiki, um, the address I think I've given you, IMK 209 wiki spaces. Um, you'll find under on the left hand side here a few things. So if you click resources, you will come to this page. Okay, and uh, I have some resources on food rheology. These are the links to some of the useful website. For example, here you can see this uh, presentation on rheology measurements, flow, and viscosity. 80 minutes uh, presentation given by the expert from Melvin Instrument. Melvin Instrument is the manufacturer or supplier that uh, supply the state-of-the-art equipment and instrument to measure particle size and other things. Another presentation here, rheology explain oscillation and viscoelasticity. And uh, here, a basic introduction to rheology. This presentation, about you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, are given by the expert. They are more expert in this subject. I'm not expert. So, if we have time, if you want to revise and understand more from what I have, we have covered in lecture, feel free to watch and listen to this uh, presentation. And if you feel uh, like, uh, I mean, doing a summary, do it. Do a summary, and uh, if you want to share, you know where to share. And uh, there are a lot more actually presentation online presentation which uh, you can find if you know where and how to find. For example, Dr. Malcolm Bond. This guy is perhaps we want to say the sifu or the guru lah, as far as texture and rheology is concerned. You can see he's very, very old. He came here once in USM, very old already. And some of the original concept and principles in texture analysis. For example, um, I don't know whether we have watched uh, my lectures, the online lectures, texture profile analysis, TPA. In short, we know we, uh, texture profile analysis or TPA. This guy in, was involved directly to uh, define the parameters in the texture profile analysis. So, and he has uh, actually published a book with the same title. I saw someone, Izudeno, someone shared the book. Uh, you get the whole book. Um, and this guy also from uh, North Carolina State uh, University talk about food texture and viscosity. And Ross Clark, also a well-known scientist, talk about the basics of how to do texture analysis and other things. So I'm sharing all this uh, on this wiki. So you are actually, um, you have more than what actually you need to study about the, the first topic, rheology and texture. And I'm, but I'm not, I'm not going to uh, cover on the texture part, texture analysis, textural properties. Uh, I have given you uh, on the Edmodo the link to those uh, online lecture. Maybe it's not as good as it sounds, you know, uh, and not as the same. I mean, the same as when if we have it, uh, if if I give the lecture. Uh, but please uh, listen to those uh, lectures. And here under lecture summary, uh, 
I've given summary for each lecture and you can go through and you can get more references there. Okay. Now I want to move on to our second topic. We don't have many topics in this course, maybe we have four yeah, or five. So today we're going to start with food colloids, emulsion and foam. Um, part of this lecture actually already available on YouTube. Uh, it's a recorded lecture. Um, what you see here on this slide is actually examples of some of the common uh, form of emulsion as well as foam. Yeah? So basically, um, this topic and topic on emulsifiers in IMK221, they complement each other. So actually, it's good. So what you learn here, we can relate to the topic on emulsifiers in food ingredient. Okay? So what do we expect to learn at the end of this course? So, uh, I mean, at the end of this topic, some terminologies, okay? Um, in emulsion, we have this term, dispersed system, colloid, emulsion, foam, amphiphilic, lipophilic, hydrophilic, emulsifier, stabilizer, surface tension, interfacial tension, plateau border. So, you will come across these terms. Probably, it will be alien to you first, not, you know, maybe you are not very uh, familiar. But at the end of this course, you should be able to define the term, understand and know the meaning. Know and understand the meaning and when to use these terms correctly. Just when, when, if, when we learn any new language, we should use the terms correctly with the grammar and everything. So then uh, identify types of emulsion and foam. Um, describe methods to form an emulsion and foam the process, what kind of equipment that we can use to form the emulsion. Explain why energy is necessary to form an emulsion. We need the energy. When we mix, so that actually we, uh, the action, the, the, the act of applying energy to disperse the liquid into another liquid to form emulsion or to disperse the air into liquid to form a foam. Explain why an emulsion is inherently unstable. Oil and water cannot mix, but we force them to mix. We force them to mix, but still they want to separate again. So why they are so unstable? Explain the role of emulsifier and stabilizer. By now, I think you already probably uh, can explain this. Describe this DLVO theory. DLVO, four letters stand for four different persons, scientists. The story behind this is also interesting, but I'm not going to tell a story this morning. Uh, when we come to this, I will say more. Describe the various ways by which emulsion and foam become unstable. So when we understand the factors which can make the emulsion unstable, then we can... Uh, find ways to make it stable. Explain the method to measure and predict emulsion stability. We can make a prediction. Yeah? How long the emulsion will be stable? One hour, one day, one week, one month? So there's a way to predict. And this is important when we want to uh, predict the shelf life of the product. Describe methods to stabilize emulsion and foam. References, as usual, only uh, selected references uh, here or on the on the slide here, but there are plenty. There are plenty of references available for this topic, emulsion and foam, in the form of books, in the form of articles, in the form of present presentation video on YouTube, and some of you already shared this on Edmodo, IMK221, as well as IMK209. And some of those videos actually very good. They can explain better than I can explain. So I hope I'm, I, I still have my value here in the classroom. <laughs> because when I saw that video, oh my god, this is very good, you know? Uh, anyway, uh, oh, by the way, uh, this is uh, the second one, Emulsifiers. Uh, this book is um, 
part of the series on the, by Egan Press. It's a very thin book, colorful. I like the book, um, but we have only one copy, I think, in the library. So please don't keep the book to yourself. Don't hide the book. Please yeah, share the book. Uh, but I saw some of you um, actually uh, managed to get some chapters from this book and upload it or share and share it on Enmodo. Well, I'm not responsible for the copyright infringement. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but I'm sure you know, all of you know this book, Food Analysis by Nielsen. You are using it now? Yeah. IMG 204, IMG 203. Yeah, it's a very, very good book. I think now it's second or third edition already. But in this book also, it's not all about chemical analysis. The, the last few chapters, you will find one chapter on rheology. You'll find one chapter on food emulsion and foam, right? And the way, is, the, way the chapters are written is very good. So strongly recommend, rec uh, I would recommend for you also to refer to those chapters in this book. But again, Nielsen book is very, very popular. Uh, I don't know how many copies we have. I haven't been to the library for many years already. Yeah? Because everything now is on the fingertips, right? Question. But you don't have to answer because I know you, you have the answers already. <laughs> but you can answer still. What do, you, what do mayonnaise, margarine, butter, milk, and coconut milk have in common? <laughs> They are emulsion. What do ice cream, meringue, marshmallow, bread, and cake better have in common? They are foam. Very good. You all have learned very well. Good. And emulsion and foam. We're going to introduce now another term here. You already know what is emulsion, you already know what is foam, but both of them, they are so-called dispersed system. Because basically when we want to form an emulsion, we would have to disperse one liquid into another liquid. And we want to form a foam, we have to disperse the air into the liquid. We have to incorporate the air. The action of mixing is actually to draw in the air and incorporate it in the liquid and disperse them uniformly to form the bubbles or the air cell. So disperse system can be defined as a system in which one substance, so-called dispersed phase, is distributed in discrete unit in discrete unit throughout a second substance called continuous phase. Sorry for the spelling mistake. Each phase can exist in solid, liquid, or gaseous state. So that's, these are three main uh, states, yeah? gas, liquid. And what about the term colloidal dispersion, or also known as sol? Sol. Soul, S O U L. Soul. <laughs> okay. Dispersion of two, this is defined as dispersion of two or more immiscible materials. So originally they are not uh, miscible, they are immiscible. Containing structural entities in the size range of one nanometer to one millimeter. So it can be within that range. They exist as a dispersed, uh, discrete, dispersed unit. Yeah? And the simplest type of colloidal system consists of a single dispersed phase of particles in a second continuous space called dispersion medium. So all these are actually um, this description about the dispersed system. So we can um, show schematically, diagrammatically. So we have a system. So let's say you know we take one unit of that system and we magnify it 
So we have, let's say in this case, we have the oil, the yellow, mm -hmm. the yellow color, dispersed in the blue background, which is a continuous phase. In this case, let's say it's water, because we are talking about food emulsion here. So oil and water. And the boundary, the physical boundary between the dispersed phase or the droplet and the continuous phase that is called interphase. So in this case, we have liquid-liquid interface. In the, in the case of foam, we have liquid air interface. And that interface, this interface play actually a very important role to determine later the stability of the emulsion. Yeah, the stability of the emulsion. So, as if you read a book or any article on emulsion, you will come across a, the, the term like the interfacial property. Yeah? The interfacial property which refers to the interfacial between the two liquids in the case of emulsion. So if we put in, the, in this form, this table, we have dispersed phase. Remember, all the continuous phase and the dispersed phase can exist in three states. Yeah? So if we have a solid dispersed phase, uh, in solid continuous phase, we call it, this actually a glass. But we are more interested in what? Emulsion and foam in this case. So emulsion, we have a liquid as a dispersed phase, dispersed in another liquid as a continuous phase. We have emulsion. And in the case of foam, we have gas as a dispersed phase, dispersed in liquid as a continuous phase. We have foam. We also have a solid foam. We have gas and we have solid as a continuous phase. Things like bread, marshmallow, those uh, we can describe them as solid foam. Yeah. Liquid foam, something like ice cream. Yeah, we have fine bubbles trapped in the ice cream. So those can be considered as liquid foam. Our, we are interested in this only for this topic. Um, so, uh, this, uh, dispersion or suspension of liquid droplets in a liquid continuous space is called emulsion, and the foam is a coarse dispersion of gas bubbles in a liquid or solid continuous phase. So, we are clear the meaning of emulsion and foam. Um, when we disperse one liquid into another liquid, depending on how we disperse them, what instrument, what equipment we use, homogenizer, mixer, ultrasonic uh, equipment, a vacuum, there are many ways. Many ways to disperse one liquid into another liquid. So depending on the method we use and the operational condition, the temperature, the, even the 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 um, properties of the oil and so on. So we can get two types of or two um, kind of system, emulsion system here. One, we have the dispersed phase, dispersed and distributed quite homogeneously, quite uniform. But another one, we have something like this. We have big Droplet here, we have not so big here, we have very small, so they are not uniform. And here, we use a term to describe this situation, we use the term droplet size distribution, or particle size distribution. How do we measure that? Uh, this is where we need a good instrument. Yeah? We can use microscope, and we can measure the diameter of each droplet, if you have thousands of droplets, it's going to be very, very tedious and very messy. But you can do that. Then you can report what is the, you can draw a diagram, a histogram, and you can get a distribution. But now we have a state-of-the-art Changi equipment that costs maybe half a million. Yeah? So this equipment like uh, those manufactured by Melvin, 
yeah, Melvin instrument, the one that I show in the link just now. So they use a light scattering technique. Yeah? Uh, we come to that later. But by using this instrument, we can measure the so-called the particle size or droplet size distribution. Why it, why it is important to know about droplet size distribution? Because that will tell us about the characteristic of the emulsion. That can give us information about the stability of the emulsion. That can tell us also during storage, the changes that would happen during storage, and we can make a prediction how stable is the emulsion. So this information, droplet size distribution, is one of the important parameters when we characterize or analyze an emulsion. By using an uh, instrument, uh, I will describe about the, about the instrument in, let, in the next uh, lecture. But by using the instrument, we can measure the so-called distribution. So this is distribution, just like a normal distribution. Yeah? So in this case, we can plot the percent frequency. Yeah? This is actually a frequency distribution. You learn in statistics, right? So then we plot, in this case, on the y-axis, sorry, in the x-axis, it's a diameter in micron. So it range from 0.1 to 10 micron. 10 micron is, can you see 10 micron with no. our eyes? Not really, yeah? not really. 10 micron, well, 10 micron maybe just barely you can see, but you need a microscope so that you can see. So you can, you, can, you can imagine now, the emulsion actually consists of a very, very tiny, uh, fine droplets. Even the biggest one maybe cannot be seen also with our naked eyes. So in this case, we have three emulsion. Um, I don't know why I put the label emulsion one, three, and five. Should be one, two, or three. <laughs> but anyway, we have emulsion one here. We have emulsion three here. And we have emulsion five there. Again, when we look at this diagram, it actually it tells us a lot of information. Okay, just looking at the diagram, uh, what give me one information from the diagram? Anyone like to try? Shapinas? What can you say about these three emulsion? In terms of the size droplet, droplet size distribution. Okay, try. Uh, Shukri, yeah, okay. Okay. More even, yeah. I think, yeah, I can accept that. What about compared to emulsion one and three? Okay. Why? Why? Why do we say? Why do we say so? Because the peak is very narrow. Right. Okay. This one is wider. Emulsion 1, emulsion 5, you can see the base here, they are wider, right? So you can now say one of the information from this, gram, uh, this diagram, emulsion 1 and emulsion 5, they have a wider droplet size distribution compared to emulsion 3. If you look under the microscope, if I were to ask you to sketch, what the droplet size distribution, distribution would look like under a micro, light microscope, then we can imagine for emulsion 3, the, the droplet size are more or less the same. Just like uh, this picture probably can describe emulsion 3. Whereas emulsion, the, the other two emulsions just now may be more like this. 
Yeah, that's one information. What other information can we get from this graph? Um, to describe the homogeneity or the uniformity of the droplet in the emulsion, we use the term monodisperse and polydisperse. So in this case, emulsion, oops, emulsion 3 in this case can be represented by this. And since they, are, they have more or less, you know, the, more or less the same uh, droplet size, so this system is called mono dispersed. Mono stands for one. So we can imagine that they have more or less the same or average uh, uh, diameter. Yeah? But this one is called poly dispersed because they have a different range, different sizes of droplet size. So now we have learned two new terms here, mono dispersed or poly dispersed. So that describes the polydispersity, it, which means that we can, we, can, we can describe the polydispersity, in other words, the uniformity or the heterogeneity of the droplet size in any emulsion. Okay? So we have learned about this term, polydispersity. So under this, we have monodispersed or polydispersed. Then another term now. So today, we just learned terms. <laughs> Okay, because when you read any article or books, you will come across this term. So you better make sure you understand, you know the meaning and understand the meaning. Uh, another important term to describe emulsion is a volume fraction. Uh, volume fraction simply is, uh, remember in emulsion, we have dispersed phase, liquid phase. So the, so the volume fraction actually take the ratio. Okay, so we take the ratio of the volume, the total volume of the dispersed phase divided by the total volume of the system. So this is a system, the whole system. Then we have the dispersed phase. We measure the volume, so we assume the spherical shape. We measure the volume of the uh, dispersed phase. Then we know the volume of the whole system, so we get a ratio. So when we compare these two systems, um, and for a mono dispersed system, we will get a value, the ideal value. Ideal means if we can arrange all the droplet in that very, you know, uh, in that range, uh, ordered arrangement, the ideal close packing, meaning that the droplet are close to each other, packed to each other, there's no more you know, ruang or space like this, the ideal will get the volume fraction of around 0.6. Whereas if the droplets are arranged randomly, you will get around 0.5. So a value between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6, when you measure the volume fraction, how, you, how do you measure? We can use instrument to measure. That will tell you your emulsion is a mono dispersed system. A mono dispersed emulsion would likely have a greater, a longer stability. But if you have a value much greater than this value, then you can say that your emulsion is a poly dispersed system. The droplet size distribution is quite uh, wide. So when you compare a mono dispersed and poly dispersed, then you can actually predict which one is more stable than the other. The poly dispersed system, the more poly dispersed is the emulsion, the more or the less stable is the emulsion. But remember, this value, the poly dispersity value, the volume fraction is only one of the parameters that we can use to predict the stability of the emulsion. Later we will learn there are more factors that we need to consider. So it doesn't actually tell you the whole story. But it can be you as one of the parameters to guide us to predict the stability of the emulsion. 
Then another term is food colloid. Colloids generally include dispersion containing larger particles more than one millimeter. In uh, most of our food, just now we learned the term dispersed system, right? So most of our food actually they are, they exist in the form of dispersed system. Food dispersion encompasses suspension such as sugar fondant, solid sugar particles in saturated sugar solution, emulsion such as milk, cream and spread, and foam such as found in beer, ice cream and bread. So our food is actually a complex system. It's not a simple oil in water system or water in oil system. We have salt, we have sugar, we have flavor. So all this actually uh, soluble, soluble, uh, soluble in the water part of the emulsion. We have vitamins. Some vitamins are fat soluble. So some are water soluble. So some vitamin will be in the oil part of the emulsion. Some vitamin will be in the water part of the emulsion. Some flavors are soluble in water. So they will be partition themselves in the water phase of the emulsion. Some flavor compound are actually fat soluble. So they will be they will partition themselves in the fat portion of the emulsion. So food is a complex system. The fat itself in the emulsion, the fat itself can crystallize. So the emulsion now can become more complex now. If you take any food, try to picture what are the components in that food that constitute the dispersed system of the food. So usually most food would contain some kind of emulsion. So we always have the oil phase and the blue color. The background is a continuous phase, which is the water phase. Then in the food, we have all other things that I mentioned just now. We have sugar. So the sugar can solubilize in the water portion, the aqueous portion of the emulsion. But sometimes the sugar can crystallize. So they will form a crystal. The fat, the fat itself can crystallize to form a fat crystal. In the oil phase, in the oil phase of the emulsion, it can contain other things that is soluble in fat. Um, then if we have added emulsifier into the system, where is the emulsifier molecule? The emulsifier molecule now would arrange and orient themselves at the interface between the drop, between the dispersed phase, the oil phase, and the water phase. They will be around here. Remember the picture I showed yesterday or the day before? Yeah? All the tadpoles around the droplet. So they form actually a kind of layer around each of the droplet. And if the system is also a foam, so this is actually a good representation of an ice cream actually. Because ice cream is an emulsion and as well as foam. And in ice cream we have fat crystal, we have ice crystal, sometimes we have lactose crystal as well, if not if the process is not controlled properly. We have flavors, we have Gums, locust bean, we have carrageenan, we have gelatin sometimes. So these gums, they can be present as a micromolecule adsorbed on the droplet surface. So this is a good representation actually of a complex system. Uh, in this case, maybe the, uh, I would say ice cream is probably the best example to represent this system. Okay. I think we have to stop here because the next one uh, I'm going, going to talk about surface and interfacial tension. But before you come to the class next week, maybe you want to explore on your own the meaning of surface tension. The basic of understanding emulsion is to understand about surface tension and interfacial tension. Just like, you know, if you want to learn how to read, you have to start with ABC. So if you want to understand emulsion, you have to understand about surface tension and interfacial tension. Okay, bye for now. See you all next week.